Great. Um, hello. <laughs> Good to see you again, sir. How are you? Not too bad. So sorry. No, don't worry. Don't worry. It's the nature of these things. Right. So um, we will start into then we're live now, sir, just to let you know. Um, I want to welcome back to our final session of um, Every Dars Emigration Museum's Out in the Past Hub. Um, and <clears throat> joining us is Sarah Phillips uh, for the talk, Ireland and the Road to Gender Recognition 1990 to 2015. So <clears throat> to remind everyone and also to explain for Sarah, for Q&A, um, people are watching in on a YouTube live and they can leave questions in the live chat, uh, which I can then relay back to you at the end of the talk. So um, without further ado, Sarah, if you'd like to, um, you can share slides if you have any, uh, or other than that, just take it away and uh, I'll, I'll drop off and, and sit back and enjoy the talk. So thanks. Great, thank you. And I'm just gonna try and share my screen if that's okay. Um, that, should be, that should be it. Hopefully everybody can see that. That looks perfect, um, thanks. Thank you very much and apologies for the delay and the uh, trying to get in um, to speak to you all this evening. Um, so this evening, I want to talk about um, the Ireland and the Road to Gender Recognition 1990 to 2015. But uh, in preparing this talk, I have decided also to try and bookend it with a little bit of information leading up to 1990 and also what has happened uh, since just to kind of finish it out a little bit. Um, so first of all, I just want to leave you with this or start off with this statement. Behind this legal case, there is a story of great human proportions which unfortunately this judgment in a court of law is unable to adequately portray or properly recreate. And that sentence came from Justice McLean McKechnie uh, in the Dr. Lydia Foy case in 2007, um, and sorry, in 2002. And the problem I think is, is that while we're about to talk about gender recognition and a legal uh, process and an act of law, in reality, this has quite a very serious effect on individuals' lives. And I'll touch on that as I go through Dr. Foy's own case um, when I get, get it to that. But to start off, just to give you an idea, and I've said many, many times when I've spoken here on behalf of the Irish Trans Archive, there are a lot of different trans people throughout history in Ireland. We didn't just come out of um, the woodwork in the last 10 years. In fact, these are just some of the individuals and colorful individuals that are actually Irish and have straddled the globe over the past 200 years, 200 to 300 years. Um, and you can go and check them out yourself. There's some really interesting stories. They're probably, they are best, some of the better known ones. However, we do have a lot of other names which I'm currently trying to uh, research and hopefully we will have a lot more information on some of these names. Um, when, you know, as, as time moves on. So trans people have been here forever. And then why is gender recognition important? And why is the ability to be able to be recognized in the gender that uh, you believe you are, but at a state level, why is that important? And over the past, between prior to 1960, you know, trans people were very much in the shadows. They were very much living in secret. They didn't really uh, come out unless somebody re outed them already. Some of those names that I mentioned earlier, if you look at them, you know, Michael Dillon gets outed by uh, the Daily Mail, I think it's the Daily Mail, if I remember rightly. Dr. James Barry gets outed upon his death. Edward DeLacy Evans gets outed when he has, a car, has an accident. Uh, Albert Cashier gets run over by a car and again gets outed. And a lot of these stories are very much kept in the uh, privacy of their own lives and as they traverse life as best they can uh, throughout that period of time. However, with the, on, uh, with the advent of um, surgery and medical care, we find in the 1950s that uh, people like Christine Jorgensen, Rebecca Berta Cowell in the UK all start to have a much more public um, 
visibility to their lives because the media find out about what's happening to them and they start to talk about them and start to write about them. Um, however, what, something that occurs as that publicity and as that visibility happens, trans people start to become more, I suppose, colourful. People start to see their lives in a much diff very different way. And there, within UK law, there is a simple administrative process prior to the six, 1960s to be able to change your birth certificate. And the reason why I've put up this slide, uh, which is a slide of April Ashley, who's a very revered and well-known trans woman from Liverpool. Um, April Ashley gets married to uh, her then husband, um, uh, Mr. Corbett, who happens to be coming from, uh, I suppose, the lower aristocracy in the UK. And they have a reasonably, you know, happy kind of initial part of their marriage. However, as time moves on, uh, Mr. Corbett decides he doesn't want to be married to April anymore. And rather than having to go through a divorce where he would have to provide 50% of his um, wealth to her, he decides to try and take a legal case to say that April was never female in the first place. And it's quite a controversial case um, in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And by 1970, uh, the judge finds that actually in favor of Mr. Corbett, that actually April is considered within law, still a man. And you'll see the horrible headline on the right hand side um, there. And this is quite controversial because there are a number of um, trans people who at that point had started to get married. They were starting to settle down, uh, have their you know, private lives um, without the attention of the press. However, April's, um, you know, I suppose April's visibility brought this and, and also the, the legal case itself brought this, um, the attention of the press, you know, quite, quite a lot. And it's quite well reported during 1970 when the, the case is, uh, is found in February 1970. So it changes the status of trans people um, as we go and the way they are treated then moving forward into the 70s, they're seen very, very differently because prior to that, they were, you were seen and the gender that you presented. So during the 1970s, the trans community are starting to come back, uh, are starting to form communities. They're starting to get in touch with each other. They're starting to form groups. Uh, you see groups in the UK or in, um, uh, in Ireland starting to form one such group, which form, was formed in 1966 in the UK, it was called the Beaumont Society. And similarly then uh, in Dublin, the Friends of Ian and the Friends of Ian start to advocate for not just rights, but also social acceptance. I'm not going to try and take too long on this because we want to get to gender recognition specifically. As, as the 1980s happens throughout the UK, and I'm focusing specifically on the UK here because obviously Ireland during that period of time very much looked to the UK and what they were doing and how uh trans people were seen in the uk and especially in the uk media late in the in the 1980s caroline cossey who at the time was a very you know well-known model um and had been outed she'd been for instance she'd been in a james bond movie she'd been um, mod modeling in some of the catwalks in in europe she didn't been in various different newspapers modeling and she was not, only, first of all, was a well-known model, but then she was outed again by the press. However, at a point during the late 1980s, she wants to marry her boyfriend. And because the UK has clearly changed this law back in 1970 with April Ashley's case, uh, Caroline decides to take the legal case against the British government, but then which goes all of the way to the European Court of Human Rights. I'm afraid Caroline's case is lost. And at that point, there is nothing really can, can change and she is not allowed um, to marry her boyfriend. 
So, sorry, just one moment. Wait. Maybe Bob's not moving here. Um, so, however, she was granted, she had been granted a passport with female on it in 1976. And this was one of the arguments she wanted, you know, marry her, her boyfriend at that point and, and felt that this identification document would allow her to do that. However, again, similar to Ireland, uh, the fundamental document of identification is the birth certificate. And therefore, because her birth certificate still remained male, she was not allowed to change it, uh, change her, her, or sorry, not allowed to change it and then get married. So we see throughout then a campaign by the trans community to start looking for what's then known as legal recognition. And a, a small group of people, namely Press for Change, is formed in the UK in 1992. And it begins to advocate for both not only equality for all trans people in the UK, but also legal recognition. So the idea of legal recognition is formulated at that point. And Press for Change, formed by Mark Rees and Stephen Whittle, two trans men, and uh, aided by other trans women, Christine Burns, Angela Clayton, and Claire McNabb, and many other activists throughout that period of time, um, start to advocate and lobby and formulate what it means to have recognition and to be recognized in the gender uh, of your, your preferred gender. And we start to see this idea that trans people are going to uh, advocate for their legal rights. As part of that, Press for Change then support uh, a number of different cases to try and move the issue forward within, within the courts. And they support, um, for instance, uh, two cases that eventually end up in the Strasbourg court again in uh, 2002. And I'll come back to that again in a minute. I mean, this, this was the idea that uh, trans people were not only providers, you know, coming together and creating community groups, but actually coming together and creating an advocacy group that was going to, you know, lobby at the highest level of government um, and advocate for their rights and show why it was necessary, you know, was very different and very new in, in both in the UK and Ireland at that point in time. So we come to the heroine or the hero of the hour, um, Dr. Lydia Foy. So in, in the late uh, 1980s, Dr. Foy transitions, um, realizes that she has no documentation that provides her with the, her identity. And um, because all her documentation, her passport at back then, her driver's license, her birth certificate, all have mail on her, um, on those documents. And she needs to be able to look at uh, being able to traverse life, you know, going, whether she travels, or not, whether she uh, goes to uh, social services, whether she needs to get a driver's license, etc. All every time it's an embarrassment that she has to out herself to explain why her documentation is wrong. So Dr. Foy in 1993 um, writes to the Registrar General. And the reason why she writes to the Registrar General is because as you'll see on the on the right hand side, a copy of the letter of response that she gets from Patrick Kyo, um, your uh, coherent, like, well, I'm not going to try and pronounce it, sorry, um, at this time of night, um, but the Registrar General. Um, the response she gets is basically that there's no mechanism within Irish law to be able to make a change that she's requesting and that they will uh, keep her um, uh, letter on file and that her application is currently being. Um, considered. Now that application obviously is denied um, for nearly 22 years. So Dr. Foy starts to look at how on that uh, refusal, how she can move things forward. And she approaches the Free Legal Advice Centres, um, otherwise known as FLAC, and FLAC advise her that the only way that she can actually change any of her documentation is by changing her birth certificate, which, as I said earlier, is the fundamental um, document of identity here in Ireland. So when she does that, they recommend that she takes a legal case against the Irish state to 
um, to try and uh, see how how she can how she can get her documentation changed. And Dr. Foy is not really looking for necessarily a birth certificate. She's looking for some sort of documentation, whether it's a passport, um, you know, whether it's a driver's license, anything at all will do. And and again, you know, th th that's an important uh, specific uh, detail that you know I'll touch on again later on because you know she starts out on a trek, a twenty-two year trek to change her birth certificate in order to uh, get a passport or a driver's license or some other documentation that you might have that you can actually show if somebody asks for identification. So to, between 1992 and 19, or 1993 and 1997, a lot of the groundwork then is prepared by Flack and Dr. Foy's legal team. And it becomes very clear that um, they, uh, they need to take a case. And in 1997, they set proceedings forward. Uh, and that case comes to court in October 2000 and was heard over 14 days um, in the High Court by Justice Lee McKechnie, the man I mentioned earlier on, who plays a pivotal role in this in this legal case. And Dr. Foy argued, you know, that while on one level she may have been uh, physically male, that she was mentally and or female, and at that point, I'm sorry, had been born physically male, that at that point that she was both mentally and physically female and should be recognised as such. So that case is heard over, as I say, 14 days, but the judgment actually is reserved and isn't heard until uh, July 2002, at which point Judge Justice McKechnie rejects Dr. Foy's claim. And again, like previously in the UK court with Corbett first Corp Corbett held that the physical and biological indicators should be used to determine sex and gender. In the case of Corbett and Corbett, they went to the European Court of Human Rights. Um, and at that point, when Dr. Foy was refused, she decided, or her legal team decided to review the situation and maybe consider also taking a legal case um, against the Irish state in the Strasbourg court. And ironically, on the day after that she wins or loses that case, uh, the court um, finds uh, in Strasbourg for Goodwin and another case, uh, which is known as I, that, sorry, that, um, sorry, the decision, sorry, they find that actually both of those cases two days later on the 11th of July, and in both cases, the court unanimously held that the UK had breached um, the rights of trans women, Miss Christine Goodwin and Miss I, by failing to recognise them in their female gender and by refusing to let them marry in that gender. So Dr. Foy then decided to, uh, legal case, to, the legal team decided to appeal. However, upon that appeal, uh, they realized that actually there was still no mechanism within Irish law and therefore they would have to uh, maybe consider taking a second case rather than necessarily trying to go ahead with that appeal. So on one level, they let the appeal run. And then the second one was they took a legal case based on the judgment of um, Goodwin versus Goodwin, uh, or sorry, Corbett versus Corbett um, in, in the... Um, in the European Court of Human Rights. Um, so in the meantime, Dr. Foy's uh, life has been thrown upside down. Um, you know, a lot of journalists were following the case, saying some horrible things about her. Um, they were doorstepping her uh, in, her, in her home um, and they were discussing her life. Her family at this point had also, uh, abandoned her, had left, um, they disowned her and, and cut off all contact. And in fact, the opposition, the state, tried to bring her family into the court to fight the case against her. So it took a huge toll on her mental health at this point in time, but she was determined 
And, and as she will say herself, the reason why she was determined was because she believed she would always have the right of reply and therefore that her case should always be given that right. Um, and throughout that first case up until 2002, she never believed that she had been given the right of reply. So she continued that case and they continued on uh, fighting the um, fighting the argument um, in in uh, 2000 and, uh, in 2005 they brought that case forward and the court heard both the appeal and the the um, uh, the, the second case well they took another two years uh, to make a decision um, and at that point uh, the judge judge McKechnie again uh, ruled uh, for Dr. Foy, um, sorry, just move forward slightly, found that, uh, gave his judgment of the second case, which is not the appeal, but the, the actual second case, that the, that he granted a declaration under Irish law that was, it, that it was incompatible with the European Convention on Human Rights in failing to provide recognition for trans people. And the, the then government, the Irish government, decided to appeal to the Supreme Court. However, it was rather stupid of them in one level because Ireland had signed up to the European Convention on Human Rights and therefore if it had have gone to eventually the Supreme Court and then the European Court of Human Rights, Dr. Foy, based on the Corbett and Corbett case, would have actually won the case, albeit that it would have been delayed. And as we always say, justice delayed is justice denied. So. In 2007, um, Dr. Mc, or Justice McKechnie uh, fines for Dr. Foy and against the state. And in, in finding, uh, in his finding on the day, he makes a very important statement, I think, that really should be considered across all aspects of Irish society. And in his summing up, he says, everyone as a member of society has the right to human dignity with individual personalities, has the right to develop his being as he sees fit, subject only to the most minimal of state interference being essential for the convergence of the common good. Together, sorry, together uh, with human freedom, a person subject to the acquired rights of others should be free to shape his personality in the best way suited to his person and to his life. And I think this is what I think really underlines the whole idea of gender recognition, the ability to be recognized for who you are. With the incoming uh, coalition government in 2010 and the then junior partner Labour make the part of their program for government to, imp to drop the appeal and to implement uh, some mechanism for transgender people to be able to change their gender on their birth certificate. And uh, Minister uh, Burton, uh, Joan Burton decides to convene what is known as the Gender Recognition Advisory Group, better known to most of us as the GRAG, um, in 2010. There was lots of different problems with the, the GRAG in the sense that it, it went through the various different processes, the various different issues. It looked at um, other legislation from around the globe and the more recent legislation in 2004, which had uh, been enacted as part of that pressure that had been put on by Press for Change. Um, and at that point was probably the most progressive piece of gender recognition legislation globally. Um, it looked at other areas of the globe where gender recognition was available. It asked for submissions from which many trans individuals, small trans groups, uh, LGBT groups, and wider civil society, such as you know, the Free Legal Advice Centers, the Irish Council for Civil Liberties, um, Amnesty International all submitted their recommendations. However, one of the key things that occurred with the GRAG was that not all of both 
LGBT and trans groups and individuals and civil society were on the same page necessarily as to what um, should be provided in by way of legislation. And we had various different degrees, such as the then legal recognition in the UK, which required uh, two years living in role, uh, approval of medical uh, doctors, specific medical doctors, and the ability to go, go to a what was known then as an expert panel and provide all your documentation in order to prove that you were trans enough in order to be recognized. Um, because of this, I suppose, disconnection between all the various different um, individual and groups that sub made submissions to the GRAG, it meant that the GRAG felt that actually the trans community themselves didn't know what they want. So what they did was they took the UK legislation and recommended that Ireland implement the exact same le legislation. This didn't go down too well with many activists. It didn't go down too well with many trans groups. And in fact, at the launch of the, the GRAG on by, by uh, Minister Burton at the time, there was actually quite a lot of uh, anger uh, and it didn't really help. So it meant, it also meant that, you know, people who were in existing marriages, uh, for instance, couldn't, um, or civil partnerships would be forced uh, to break up their marriages in order to be recognized, which was really causing serious hardship for, for families. However, that wasn't the end of the process. Um, you know, the, uh, community made a decision that they were going to come try come together so that everybody would be on the same page and they would start to try and speak to government to understand what legislation had been already developing globally because the UK uh, legislation was now starting to be outstripped and, and passed over by other countries at that point and there was a lot of talk about new ideas specifically the idea that you know, both Press for Change back in 1992 had, had tried to push, and also the idea that some other um, countries had started to look at legislation for, and that was the idea of self-determination. The idea to decouple uh, the medical requirements from a legal right. And the community through a lot of different groups, as I said, FLAC, ICCL, Amnesty, uh, Tenney, um, the Glen, who were then the LGBT main organization, all came together to try and talk about what it meant and what the trans community were really looking for. And one of the key moments of that uh, early kind of advocacy was the Transgender Europe Conference, which was held in Dublin in DCU in 2012, at which point uh, Minister Burton was actually uh, invited to be the keynote speaker. And during her speech, despite the fact of some protests and quite loud protests at that, Minister Burton in her speech actually said the trans people has, deserved and should have the right to um, self-determine their gender identity. It got lost a little bit, as I say, within the protests, it got lost within the noise, but however, there was a clear uh, belief within government that we should look towards some sort of mechanism that provided self-determination. And so the trans community, specifically through Tenney, started to mobilize and start to look uh, towards trying to advocate. And as I said earlier, smaller trans groups start to look, such as trans education advocacy, start to look at holding protests, uh, specifically at the DCU conference, but also outside Leinster House, and start to talk in the media more and more about uh, gender recognition and why self-determination uh, was key. And what we have to look at in parallel to all of these conversations is that there's a global discussion going on in relation to uh, medical care and the removal of what used to be known as gender identity disorder uh, from the uh, international classification of diseases to be knowing, to, to be changed to gender dysphoria 
and what has now happened in more recent times to be moved out of the mental health area completely and into um to be to be changed into uh, to be known as uh, sexual sexual incongruence so there's this constant moving of understanding of what it means to have a gender identity and to actually that it may be different to your assigned sex at birth so that this understanding that being transgender was not a disorder and that we as a community and as individuals deserve to be right to be recognized um, as we were. So, as I said earlier, there's quite a lot of movement at that point. One of the key change decisions also was to work with some politicians about writing legislation that, you know, maybe would be uh, putting forward the idea of what the trans community would hope for within legislation. And we had worked with Senator Catherine Zappone. We worked with uh, Deputy Angus O'Shnodig and Sinn Féin to produce pieces of legislation um, and put them forward both in the Dáil and the Shannad. And hopefully we could get to see, could we push the agenda so the government would therefore see what type of legislation could actually come into uh, being. And we spoke many times, we tried to engage the media, we spoke at Pride marches, at marriage equality marches, and we tried to put out as much uh, advertising, as much, not advertising, but more, much promotion, and try to avail of any opportunity to talk about uh, why it was increasingly harder for trans people to live their lives without the ability to change documentation and also then to be able to change your birth certificate. And what was key was that there were, there were areas of the state that were allowing you to change uh, certain documentation, such as your passport by now, but actually you couldn't change your birth certificate. So one of the, one of the key pieces of work in 2014 was an, an Amnesty International document, which was done both in Ireland, in Ireland Denmark, Norway, and Finland. And it was a, a report that came out called The State Decides Who I Am. And it clearly spoke to the needs of the community and the hardships that documentation and this lack of recognition was causing. And it focused, I think, the minds of politicians on what needed to be done. And you have to remember at this point, there is conversation going on around the, the uh, marriage equality referendum is all about to kick off in, in early 2015. And therefore, a lot of these civil rights ideas um, are being discussed within government, but also within the body politic generally. So again, as, we, as I said earlier, uh, the community through Tenney specifically continue that advocacy, continue talking, taking opportunities to present uh, to the Committee uh, on Social Protection and Education, who are debating the introduction of legislation and the heads of bill that have been produced by uh, Minister Burton, Joan Burton. And um, at that stage, it's about talking to as many different politicians to try and create as much support, create as much support within the media, produce quite a lot of documentation, you know, whether it's around transgender young people in recognition, the medical criteria being asked, because what happens is, is that within uh, the heads of bill, uh, the government are suggesting that while they want to recognize the ability of trans people to be given self-determination, they're asking for a signature to be put on the, the application. And the only people that can actually apply to, or sorry, the only people who can actually sign that document are actually medics, medics that there are very few people uh, at that point in the country who can provide that signature. And at that point also it was a bottleneck that actually the, they were those people who you would have had to go and get diagnosed from. And therefore the medical criteria was not being removed from the legal uh, right. However, in late 2014, Minister or Minister Burton gets promoted to Tanishta and passes the responsibility for the legislation to the Minister for State, Kevin Humphreys. And the bill is finally published in December 14. 
and planned for debate in both the Shannon and the Dáil in early uh, 15. The campaigning was stepped up. The community came out in force. Allies, families, uh, as much opportunity, um, you know, to talk to people, to speak to people um, was taken. There's, there's actually a very good moment where Minister Burton and Minister Humphreys and um, Rory Quinn, who was the Minister for Education at the time, meet with three families um, to understand the needs of younger people um, within, within the legislation because there was no criteria within the proposed bill for under 18s at that point. And by early January, the Shannon debates uh, commence um, to discuss the actual bill. And it has widespread support for change because most people in the Shannon, and this is all on the record, stand up and speak to, you know, why this legislation wasn't good enough. Um, and the community found many allies there willing to speak on our behalf. You know, people that you would not expect necessarily. People, obviously, the obvious ones like Catherine Spohn, David Norris, Gillian Van Turnout, Naval Power. But, you know, people, individuals that you would not expect, people like Jared Crockwell and amazingly, Fidel Mahili Eames, all stand up and believe that the bill is not uh, as it should be and should be improved. And the requirement for the medical uh, signatures should not be there. But also that, and in the case of Adele Mahili Eames' case, is that young people should be included in the bill, which they are not. Um, the government was still determined to enact the legislation, and they weren't really listening to a lot of people. They weren't listening to the Ombudsman for Children, who suggested also the inclusion of under 18s in the legislation. They wouldn't remove the divorce clause, which required trans people to, um, to divorce their spouse in order to get recognition. They did, whoever recognized that if marriage equality came in in May, that they would possibly um, you know, have no problem, then they would be able to, to remove that clause at that stage, and they wanted to wait until May. And also then there was attempts to open up that bottleneck that, we meant, that I mentioned earlier of having medics sign off on your legal rights to identify as who you choose. Um, how we did that was we looked at ways of trying to ask, um, say, for instance, GPs, everybody has a GP. Uh, therefore, instead of having these specific uh, expert medics, um, you know, if it's only a signature, why do they need to be an expert medic? Why not go to a GP? Everybody has a GP. And we asked um, at the time, and slightly sideswiped the government in this in a way, that we asked the Irish College of GPs, would they have any problem with that? They wrote a letter to say, no, they didn't have a problem with that. They, they felt their members would be okay. All they were doing was witnesses, witnessing a signature. Uh, they weren't vouching for any uh, you know, part of your identity being trans. And secondly, uh, we then, you know, when, when the uh, government said, well, we'll need to speak to the ICGP, uh, Irish College of General Practitioners, we said, and, and we'll also have to speak the, to the MO, uh, the uh, M, uh, NUI. I'm oh, sorry, lost me trying to talk there for a minute. That that we would we also produce another letter from them saying that was okay. However, coming out of the Shannon debates, all we had got was an agreement for review, and at that point we were quite disappointed, quite depressed about it all. And one of the things we decided, and this is, this is key, I suppose, sometimes it's always about little things that occur in campaigns. Um, you know, at one point we made a decision to ring every single TD because it was about to move into the doll. And on one afternoon, every TD was rang to speak and spoken to. Uh, at one point, I think, we had somewhere around 86 meetings, whether it was in person or on, on the phone uh, with 86 different TDs. Um, there were a number of people traveled around the country over the next four or five days to try and get to, to each of them to explain what was going on. Um, and at that point, by the Wednesday, um, 
the 5th of March uh, 27 TDs all across the party suggested, stood up in the Dáil and suggested, even government parties suggested that the legislation didn't go far enough and that this was the opportunity time to get it, opportune time to get it right, not to be putting in something that was wrong, but to put something in now that, that we would be all proud of going forward in the future. Um, and also that, you know, not only to move forward, but to include uh, young people in, in the legislation, to include people who are non-binary, to include uh, all the various different aspects that were being recommended by the community through the, the documentation and the literature that Tenney had provided um, it within, uh, within that period of time. And, and as we watched in the gallery, you know, every single one of those TDs all quoted from our literature, but also thanked Dr. Foy, you know, for bringing forward this uh, important uh, legal case and therefore making sure that this was something that the state was going to be bringing forward. And every single one of them, those deputies also stood up and clearly had a clear understanding of what uh, was needed. You know, Richard Boyd Barrett summed up the feeling across the house, I think, you know, where he said, we have come a long way, but it is a pity we just can't go the whole way. Um, you know, Deputy Willie O'Day referred to the fact that the bill is, in, in a way, a form of Irish solution to an Irish problem. We certainly can't state that it's based on international best practice, but that we were trying to bring in something that wasn't uh, quite all the way there. And what's important to realize is that by that point, there were already two pieces of legislation and acts both in Malta, it was a very similar type of country to Ireland, and Argentina that had given full self-determination rights to their trans citizens. And that's what we were looking to try and provide. And, you know, in the final speech on that day, Deputy Andrew Doyle stood up and said, it's important that all outstanding issues raised by the community and others are taken on board during the discussion stage. Because after so many years waiting for this legislation, after 22 years of Dr. Foy arguing, or arguing in court, um, that, you know, we must ensure that it was fit for purpose and that there was no point in legislation that is well-intentioned but is not going to work for some of us. So while the, the government at that point made the decision to, to continue the process, they decided to park the debates until after the marriage equality referendum because they felt that if they removed the marriage uh, divorce clause, they would then be able to move forward uh, again. However, in the meantime, they did in invite us in to discuss the benefits of legal recognition based on self-determination, to provide other examples of where it's used, provide the various different um, mechanisms that, that work and how an administrative process would work uh, over that period of time. Um, and which, which was very much well worth the time because they then learned about other situations and also learned about the benefit of this. In the meantime, the trans community are still in the press, in the media, in the newspapers, on the TV, in the radio, trying to argue the point of why this uh, legislation was important. But all of these things constantly being moved were little things. You know, and it's sometimes each of those little things that can change that course, um, you know, or change the course of history for that matter. You know, on that day, for instance, that I mentioned about ringing and talking to every single TD, the possible was one of those days, those parents meeting Minister Burton, you know, the, the appearances of various different trans people on television programs or radio or writing uh, opinion pieces or the... the um, the involvement of the European Commissioner for Human Rights, um, the two of them, both Thomas Hammers, Hammersberg and um, Niels Musnick, both their input writing to the government saying that it was a clear need for uh, gender recognition based on self-determination, all had an effect, I think, on um, 
where we eventually got to. And on the morning of marriage equality, and I'll share this with you, my own little moment of, of memory, is that on the morning of marriage equality uh, referendum um, being counted, uh, I remember being in uh, the RDS doing some tallies uh, on behalf of uh, the National Lesbian and Gay Federation, NXF. And I met Minister Humphreys, who was also tallying for Labour at the time. Um, and I happened to say, you could, the, the groundswell of the feeling of marriage equality was happening at that point. And I remember saying to him on that morning, you know, Minister Humphreys, if you're ever going to give us what we want, now is the time because there was such a groundswell of goodwill at that stage. And also we felt that we had made a good case as to why it was important for gender recognition based on self-determination. And that based on such a progressive concept, you know, that trans people should be the arbiters of our own identity and every individual should be the arbiters of our own identity so that we should be able to expand out this great will, this goodwill to the trans community as well. And on the Tuesday after marriage equality, um, Minister Bruton um, going into the cabinet meeting suggested that trans people at this point should be given the opportunity to um, uh, be recognized for who they are. And so on uh, the 17th of July, uh, 2015, the Shannon passed the final act uh, of what is known as the Gender Recognition Act, uh, based on self-determination. And Ireland at that point became the fourth country in the world. Uh, by that stage, Denmark um, had also joined Argentina and Malta. Um, and since then, there are now 17 countries with gender recognition based on self-determination, um, which means that there is no requirement for a medical intervention or diagnosis by a, of mental disorder. Trans people over the age of 18 are able to self-declare their gender through an administrative process. And on the 9th of, uh, the 8th of September, 2015, that act was enacted by Minister Burton. Uh, Burton. Um, and as you can see from some of the pictures there, Dr. Foy eventually receives her birth certificate. Um, she gets the first gender recognition certificate number one, and, and hence then gets her new birth certificate after 22 years, excuse me, 22 years of campaigning. Also in the same year, she receives the European Citizen, Citizen of the Year Award for, for all the work that she has done. Um, this is a copy of her birth cert. She loves being able to share it. So she's been giving me permission to share. And what's interesting, I said earlier on, I'm conscious of the time. So Morris, if I'm, Going over here, I've only a couple of more minutes left, if I think. Um, the, just what's interesting here is this 22-year uh, legal cases, because Dr. Foy had gone back in 2014 looking for redress, because seven years after, after her winning her case in 2017, or 2007, the government hadn't actually enacted any legislation, despite what Justice McKechnie had said in 2007. But what is interesting is, is that despite that 22 year campaign and despite the lobbying and the advocacy and the visibility of the trans community over the previous, you know, probably about seven or eight years, ironically, it's in more recent times, we've realized that actually since 1992, the passport office had been, had issued passports with individuals changing their gender on their passport. And in fact, if Dr. Foy in 1992 had realized that, she probably never had, would have gone down the road. She eventually went down, namely a legal case and a series of legal cases. And maybe we might not be in the situation which we are right now with gender recognition based on self-determination and still one of the most progressive pieces of legislation that's out there. So it's an interesting thing to look at and maybe somebody better than me could analyze that about you know going down that road of taking such a legal case um you know in hindsight but so what does the legal case the gender recognition act do it, it allows uh individuals to uh legally change their gender the act is binary therefore you can only move from male to female or female to male the act is accessible to over 18s 
there is a mechanism for 16 and 17 year olds to access the act. But in fairness, you have to have two medics, parental consent, and you have to go to the circuit courts in order to get approval. You probably may be better off waiting till 18, which is much quicker. It takes about two weeks. Um, there's no access for under 16s or those who identify as non-binary. There are sections which address specific gendered sex crimes. So um, to ensure that, that um, you know, that change of gender doesn't um, give you protection that you shouldn't have. Um, there is a mechanism for the minister to revoke the certificate. Also, similarly, not for those people who would, would like to try and hide behind it. It's not possible. And also the Gender Act Nation Act allows you to be issued with a new birth certificate. That new birth certificate is issued from the date that you apply from it. And your old birth certificate is locked away um, for only access, which is only accessible for you or the law. Um, where to next? I'll be finishing nearly at this. Uh, 2018, the Gender Act National Act review recommended that there should be recognition for under 16s, improvements in access for 16 and 17 year olds, recognition for non binary individuals, improvements in the administrative process, and information available across all government departments because clearly most government departments some didn't even know that there was such an act, and also a further review in two years. The problem is, is that we are now in uh, 2022, four years later, and none of these recommendations have been implemented. There have been some improvements in the administrative process. Um, however, the government has accepted that they will make the improvements in access for 16 and 17 year olds, and that's in the program of government, but nothing else has moved. Uh, part of the reason for that is COVID, but generally, uh, it's down to the fact that the government didn't move quick enough in 2018 and 2019. So thank you. That's my talk for this evening. I hope I've given you a little bit of overview of some of the things that have gone on in the history of gender recognition in Ireland. Um, so, yeah. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, <clears throat> so we are coming up to seven. <clears throat> So we don't have much time for questions, but if there are any, please do let me know and we'll try and fit at least one in. Um, <clears throat> thanks for the, the detailed talk, Sarah. I was wondering, I guess, to just to close it out, um, thanks for kind of pointing the way forward at the end, sort of a natural point to end our, our evening. Um, but I guess just about, talk about changing the legal landscape, but what do you think, some, how do we change the media landscape, right? Because I think that's quite a, important frontier as well what kind of actions do you need to take yeah and i i think i think sometimes um you know we, we talk about any social change at all i think a lot of the time we tend to see uh legal change coming before social change sometimes um and and that's difficult because in lots of ways we saw a lot of social change happening as we were arguing for that legal change but however we've as you're probably alluding to, regressed quite a lot um, mm. in recent times. Um, attitudes toward trans people are, are quite difficult at the moment. There's quite a lot of negativity out there. Um, to a certain, I, I don't like saying it's all coming from outside. It's not. There is definitely some of it here. Um, but how to change that media? I think the media is influenced these days. It's very different to say the media five years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Um, there's a lot of focus on, you know, to a certain degree, click, click base, whatever is easy to write about, whatever is easy that's being said. Social media has quite a lot, large influence on it. And, and I'm not so sure how I think to change that. I think we try to put out as much positive visibility into the media as we can um you know trans people basically all they want to do is just get on with their lives you know these are just legal rights that we're trying to achieve so that we can make our lives easier the, the ability to have a document which makes you traverse life in an easy way without causing you embarrassment or causing you problems that's all we're looking for is that that right those rights and um, and also then the rights to services that we require but generally if they're in place in both cases all we want to do is get on with our lives. We're not here to be causing trouble. And it's to try and, 
we're not trying to remove other people's rights either, you know. And you know, if if you're if you're saying that you're removing, if if we're you're removing somebody else's rights, well, that means you have all the rights. Then, and you know, that's not, you know, giving granting me rights doesn't take away from your rights. So therefore, I think there's a there's a education piece across media to understand what they're actually saying sometimes you know mm-hmm. this understanding that that actually guys some of this is nonsense it might look okay and reasonable on the page but in reality you know uh but i, I do think there's a big job of work that has to be done on trying to change that both media wise and socially um for the community generally most trans people are just getting on with their lives out there you know, they traverse the small villages and towns of this country and have supportive family and friends and schools and jobs. And, you know, it's about getting that on a, a national level for media to stop being so sensationalist about us. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Sarah. Well, I guess on that note of a, a big job of work to do, um, we'll, we'll, we'll close out. Uh, so finally then, thanks, Sarah, again, to thank everyone who, who spoke today, Vicky um, and Paul as well, and also to thank uh, James, who's been behind the scenes, managing all the tech throughout the day as well. Um, my big personal thanks to James as well. So that finishes um, Epic's contribution to Outing the Past. Please do tune in to all the other hubs that are um, hosting fantastic events, uh, some in person, some hybrid, some online so you can check all of those out and uh that's it for me sarah feel free to to log out as normal and um, thanks very much and uh i'll i'll say goodbye to you all now enjoy your respective dinners and uh your tuesday evenings it's just clearing up here in belfast so bye everyone thanks thanks